Uh, I'd like to thank uh, both uh, Susan and Julio for inviting me uh, in this. And while this is a Hopkins initiative, you can see I'm from Penn. Uh, and it's in part because I've been part of the advisory uh, committee for uh, Hopkins thinking about this. So in 1975, I was a junior in high school. And uh, I had to fill out one of these aptitude surveys that uh, people are, I don't know if people are still given this, but in 1975, students were given this. And uh, to my surprise, the results of this aptitude survey was that I should be an architect. And uh, so I ended up in medical school. <laughs> so 41 years later, I think it's probably too late for me to go to architecture school. Uh, but maybe I can sidle my way into this by talking about architecture without actually knowing anything about architecture. <laughs> so there, the existence of ANFA uh, is proof that there is an interest in the conjunction of neuroscience and architecture. And uh, a number of these books that have been at various times mentioned uh, here, uh, I could have included Palasma's uh, books uh, on this as well, but for aesthetic purposes, I wanted to keep it at three. Uh, and uh, the, uh, but it, it is a kind of conjunction of neuroscience uh, and architecture. And I use the word conjunction both in its linguistic sense, which is its neuroscience and architecture, as well as neuroscience for architecture. And what I would like to do is use this to talk about, or to talk about neuroaesthetics and what has happened in neuroaesthetics over the last 15 years, uh, and to use that as a kind of guide to what might be one version of this conjunction. And particularly, I'd like to switch the conjunction to a preposition, which is rather than neuroscience for architecture or neuroscience and architecture, to what might a neuroscience of architecture be? So if we go back at the turn of the century, uh, neuroaesthetics had some of these prominent books that are analogous to the books that, uh, that uh, uh, with architecture that I'm, I mentioned. So the, in 1999, this is Samir Zeki's book, uh, Margaret Livingston's book, I think was published in 2002. Uh, and it was this, uh, a very similar kind of project in which people very smart neuroscientists, very well respected neuroscientists, took what was known uh, and is known about neuroscience and started to apply it to aesthetic concerns. But over the last, say, 12 or 14 years, and some people have thought that 2004 was a tipping point uh, in neuroaesthetics research where something happened that was a bit subtle. And this is uh, one outcome of that, is that these books started to be published. Uh, and in part, this is a plug for my own book called The Aesthetic Brain. And what is different, slightly different about these kinds of books is that these are books in which the object of inquiry is aesthetics using neuroscientific methods. And it's a subtle distinction, but I think an important one. And so what I'd like to do is go over, I think, some of the ideas that have been developed in uh, neuroaesthetics over the last several years. Uh, and uh, submit to you that perhaps they might apply to architecture as well and use this as a vehicle for conversation. So we recently published uh, with a group uh, of a number of people across, this is an international group, uh, a paper that was in response to a lot of concerns from the humanities. Uh, in the humanities, there had been uh, some uh, concerns that the neuroscience that neuroscience was taking over. It was reductionist in a way that was uh, unappealing uh, and that neuroscientists didn't know anything about aesthetics, so on and so forth. And this was a kind of uh, paper that we wrote to, talk, to, to create some framing boundaries, uh, which I'd like to talk about. And this is to uh, point out that the cognitive neuroscience of aesthetics and the cognitive neuroscience of art, while overlapping, are not identical. And within that, the cognitive neuroscience of beauty can overlap with both of those, but again, it's not identical uh, with either one of those domains. Right? So this is a kind of framing, uh, framing slide. Now, it 
it's probably the case that you could replace this uh, circle, the cognitive neuroscience of art, with the cognitive neuroscience uh, or the neuroscience of architecture. And I say that for the following reason. This is uh, uh, some data that uh, Ed Vessel, who uh, when he was at NYU at the time that he did this, was looking at people's responses to different kinds of objects, responses in the sense of uh, an aesthetic response, a preference response. And what he finds, uh, so this is a, a kind of reliability study, and what uh, he finds and reports is that for natural objects, particularly faces, Professor Kendall mentioned that we are all experts at faces, it turns out that there is rather good agreement in, in which faces people find attractive. There is also pretty good agreement in which landscapes people find attractive. Uh, there is not very good agreement in what artwork people find attractive. And when it comes to images, architectural images, whether they're interiors or exteriors, uh, there also is not very good agreement. Uh, it tends to look more like artwork than it does like landscapes, for example. So one challenge that this brings up is the, is the variability in people's responses to architectural spaces. And so if one of your projects, one of your enterprise is to understand how people experience architecture, this starts out as a question of variability. And one version of science is that we try to understand what's the structure of variability. But if your goal as an architect is to understand how people experience uh, architectural spaces, then understanding individual variability becomes an important uh, research agenda item. If you talk about empirical aesthetics, it's hard not to go back to one of the founders. This is Gustav Fechner. And Gustav Fechner was an interesting guy. Uh, for about 10 years in the mid, uh, in the mid uh, 19th century, he was laid up. He was uh, sick for some reason. It's not exactly clear. And it is claimed that in, uh, on October 22nd, 1850, he woke up with this sudden insight. And he had been thinking about uh, this, uh, something called the Weber fraction, which uh, has to do with certain kinds of perceptual judgments, and basically came up with this fundamental insight, uh, which was then published, he, he worked on this, was published in a book in 1860 called The Elements of Psychophysics. He is generally regarded as the father of psychophysics and one of the founders of contemporary experimental psychology. Uh, but his, um, his basic insight was that there are fundamental mappings, there are principles and mappings of properties of the world that mapped onto properties of the mind, that, that our minds are not independent of the world, and that there are, there are mathematical ways in which this could be mapped. And this, uh, he worked out this mathematically. It got to be known as Fechner's Law. But the fundamental insight there was that uh, our minds uh, and the world are not disconnected, that there are mapping principles that could be elucidated. His second insight, there are three that I'd like to point out over the next uh, 25 or so years of his work. Uh, the second insight was that, um, that he talked about the psychophysics as being an outer psychophysics, but he understood that the properties of the world as they approached the mind had to be mediated through the nervous system. And he said that there had to be an inner psychophysics, but recognized that in the second half of the, of the 19th century, that the, the methods and the techniques just didn't exist for there to be an inner psychophysics, and speculated at some point in the future there would be an inner psychophysics. Uh, and we probably are at that place right now. Much of contemporary cognitive neuroscience can be regarded as a realization of Fechner's uh, speculation. And the third one has to do with aesthetics. So in 1876, he wrote a book that unfortunately has not been translated into English. Uh, it's in German. Uh, but at least the title is translated as a primer in empirical aesthetics. It is regarded as the first treatise on empirical aesthetics. And in that, he brought up the point that he thought that aesthetics could be approached, and this is, this is his terminology as translated in little snippets in English, uh, that there could be an aesthetics from below. And what he meant by that, I take to mean some of what we talked about earlier today, which is that it could be uh, that there was a bottom-up aspect to aesthetics, 
But more importantly, this is something that could be empirically addressed. And he contrasted this with an aesthetics from above. And by that, he meant a kind of argument that often philosophers made from first principles. And his general notion was that you could, instead of being prescriptive of what an aesthetic experience is, you could actually ask people and do experiments and find out what people liked. And so this was a novel idea. And he thought that as this, you had this aesthetics from below, where it met an aesthetics from above, that there would be interesting things that might happen. And I would like to argue that that is, in part, uh, some of what is going on right now. You can go even further back to ideas uh, that I think are germane. And by further back, I mean Aristotle. Uh, and we can talk about the nature of causal structure. And I think this is a kind of useful way of thinking about this entire domain, whether you're talking about neuroaesthetics or the neuroscience of architecture. Uh, and so he talks, uh, Aristotle talks about different kinds of causes. So there can be efficient causes. And by that, he means properties of stimuli that create a certain kind of state. Uh, and so this, in Fechner's terminology, would be analogous to outer psychophysics. There could be final causes. This is a kind of teleologic argument where you could say uh, that one has a, uh, an ex a certain kind of experience in order to, whatever that might be. Uh, and then these, the next two, I think, are of what is uh, partic of particular interest, uh, which is that there are formal causes. And by formal causes, I take Aristotle to mean that this is describing a set of dynamic relations, which is having a model, having a theory, having a psychology of what's going on in a componential manner, where you break down a complex phenomena into its component parts and try to understand their relationships. And finally, a material cause, which as neuroscientists we are all uh, interested in, which is what is the material basis for these kinds of experiences. And I think it's worth laying these four ways of thinking out, because while they may be related to each other and they may be related in systematic and interesting ways, uh, they, uh, they do not collapse on each other. And I think uh, it's probably worth keeping each of these in mind. So now when it comes to this uh, formal uh, uh, notion of having a kind of a model or a framework or, th or a theory, one, uh, what happened in neuroaesthetics in around 2004 was simultaneously there, was a, there is a, um, a cognitive psychologist who is in Vienna, a guy named Helmut Leder, who uh, approached neuroaesthetics from the view of abstract art and came up with the general model. And around the same time, I approached this from visual neuroscience and came up with a model. And there were ways in which these models both overlapped and were different. And the details of those models are not particularly important other than they happened around the same time, as much as the fact that since then, from 2004 to now, other people have started to work to modify, to agree, disagree with these models and continue to refine them. And so there's been this kind of uh, interest in what is an appropriate model in what context when it comes to neuroaesthetics. Uh, more recently, Ocean Vartanian and I uh, published this in Trends in Cognitive uh, Science. Uh, and the reason we set it up this way was that the earlier models tended to imply that there was a serial uh, uh, way in which things processed. And increasingly, it became clear that this sort of serial notion so it's certainly a given that information has to come in through your eyes if you're talking about visual aesthetics or through your ears if you're talking about music. But after that, the, the serial notion of it uh, became less and less uh, tenable. And so we wanted to get away from that. But, uh, but give this a kind of general way of thinking about it, which we've referred to as the aesthetic triad. But it could just as well be the triad for the experience of architecture, where you separate out sensory motor systems emotion and valuation systems, and knowledge and meaning systems. And what this allows you to do is to drill down in each of those, if you need to, and also look at the kind of interrelationships that those nodes might have, and frame this in a kind of neuroscience way. And so just if you look at this, the first thing you might realize is uh, how tough doing something in architecture is going to be. 
If you're doing visual aesthetics, particularly in the context of paintings or visual beauty, uh, you're just dealing mostly with vision. But as we've heard uh, over, uh, over some of the sessions, architecture is not confined to vision, although there might be a kind of chauvinism around vision, uh, but it's not confined to vision, that, it is, uh, that sounds are important, smells are important, and navigating through uh, spaces is enormously important. Uh, textures are important. Uh, and, and so that creates a certain kind of challenge if you have a research program. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, this uh, starts as a general framework that I think that can be applied. And what's useful about having a general framework is that when you address a certain kind of question, you still have a sense of what the whole is and where within the whole are the holes and what our knowledge is. So I'd like to bring up uh, certain kinds of notions that have, uh, have come to fore um, in discussions in neuroaesthetics. And one is the difference between what I've referred to as descriptive neuroaesthetics and experimental neuroaesthetics. And in this case, by experimental neuroaesthetics, I mean experiments in a kind of narrow sense, a narrow sense in which things are relatively controlled and one has control over specific variables in, uh, that are being manipulated and one is looking at the, the consequences of changing those variables. So in that very kind of narrow sense of experiment, uh, there is a kind of experimental neuroaesthetics and what is uh, descriptive neuroaesthetics. So I'll give you an example of descriptive neuroaesthetics, a kind of prominent one. This is uh, something that uh, Margaret Livingston uh, uh, published. I, it's, it's the cover of her book. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, I think she actually published this in Science a couple of years before her book was out. And the, 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 the general idea is, why is Mona Lisa's smile so beguiling? Why does it feel mysterious? And what she did was she applied knowledge from visual neuroscience to offer an explanation for this. So what she says is that if you look at Mona Lisa's face and you filter it based on high-frequency information or low-frequency information, you get a very different experience, which is that, uh, is that when you are confined to high-frequency visual information, you don't really notice the smile in the same way that you do with low-frequency filters on the image. Okay, so that's a claim she makes. Uh, and her explanation is what this means is that since macular vision deals with high frequency information, that when you're looking directly at Mona Lisa's mouth, you're not really seeing the smile, but when you look away, because low frequency information is gathered through our periphery, that you sense there's a smile. And so she says, here's the phenomenon. You're looking at Mona Lisa, you're looking at her, she's not smiling, you're looking away, she's smiling. Right? So this is a kind of, uh, kind of experience that some men may have had in this room uh, in real life. Uh, but there is a kind of mystery uh, to this. So very interesting idea, got a lot of attention. But it's a form of what I would call descriptive neuroaesthetics because it is taking something we know from neuroscience and applying it to a phenomena. It is not experimental in the sense that while this might be regarded as having generated a hypothesis, it is not actually testing that hypothesis. So that hypothesis has been tested, and this is, um, this is a study uh, that was uh, published by Christian Carbon's lab, uh, in which they looked at, took a bunch of subjects, had them look at different faces, and the critical thing is that the mouth was either could be neutral or could be smiling. The other thing they did was they controlled where people were looking. So people are either looking at the eyes, in which case the mouth would be in their periphery, or they're looking at the mouth. Uh, and they, they controlled by various cues how they would move. And the critical thing is when they're looking at the eyes, the actual mouth is smiling. And when they make a saccade to the mouth, they flip the image so that the mouth is no longer smiling. And there is this phenomena that when we make visual saccades, you have suppression of the visual image. So people are not aware that this is going on. Right? So this is an experimental way of trying to test uh, the Livingston hypothesis. And what do they find? Certainly when the smile is explicit, where nothing has changed, uh, people can tell uh, the, uh, that uh, the face is smiling. In the Mona Lisa condition, where it flips, 
uh, they're more likely to say uh, it's smiling than when it's not. So there is some sense of the smiling, but they're less confident about it. So, so far this seems to fit with the Livingston hypothesis. However, and, and it looks as though there is also some implicit effect of the smile so that they're not completely agnostic in the sense of their behavioral response to the smile, uh, which is that they actually think that the implicit smiling image is more attractive than the completely neutral one, but not as attractive as the explicit smiling. But there isn't, there isn't this sense that it's somehow more mysterious. Right? When the question, which is, is this what makes Mona Lisa's smile beguiling, that they are not able to confirm. Okay. So now the point about all this is, if you think Livingston is right, and it seems extraordinarily plausible, you have to deal with this, these data, and then the game is on, which is then you have to construct the experiment to say, why did these guys not do it right? And so that's what I mean by the difference between a kind of descriptive neuroaesthetics in which hypotheses, very interesting, very useful hypotheses might be generated, but it's not the same as confirming a hypothesis in which you have to then do the experiment to find out experimentally can you confirm or disconfirm that hypothesis. Now we did, uh, while we stick with faces, this is a study we did a few years ago, uh, and here I would like to bring up another idea from cognitive neuroscience that is worth your knowing about, which is the difference in, and this is in the context of imaging studies, but could very easily apply to most studies in which you have a neuroscience dependent measure. And this is the difference between a forward inference and a reverse inference. So I'll describe the experiment and then sort of play out what that means. So this is an experiment where people came in two different sessions. They looked at these faces. In one condition, they had to judge whether one face was more or less attractive than the previous one. And in another condition, they had to judge if one face was more or less attractive than the previous one, right? This is counterbalanced. They come a week apart. In one condition, they're making an identity judgment. In another, they're making a beauty judgment. In addition, what we did was we, uh, for the lower left image, uh, what we did was we functionally identified these parts of visual cortex, uh, which includes the, the, in the yellow, it's the fusiform face area, this part of occipital cortex that seems especially responsive to faces. Uh, medial to that, the parahippocampal place area. This is an area that seems to be responsive to landscapes. It turns out built, uh, built spaces as well. Uh, and this other area that uh, was also referred to earlier, the lateral occipital uh, complex. And our question was, so, and this is the part that's the forward inference. Our question was, is it the case that in these parts of the brain that we know classifies information according to these sorts of categories, does it also have an evaluative function? Right, that's the question. And what we find is in these areas uh, that Neural activity is responsive parametrically by how attractive the faces are judged, right? So this part of the brain is not simply classifying it, but it is doing something about evaluating uh, the, the, these faces. Now, what that evaluation is remains open. The second thing is we know that it is not a generalized visual response because there is no response in the parahippocampal place area. Right? So this is not a general, there's blood flow through the occipital cortex. It tends to be specific both to FFA and, uh, and parts of LOC. And in this explicit condition, there are also other parts of the brain, parts of parietal cortex, parts of inferior frontal cortex, uh, parts of the insula, so on and so forth. The second uh, forward inference, the second kind of hypothesis we wanted to test was, is it the case that in this visual cortex, this part of the brain is responsive to the attraction of faces even when people are not thinking about beauty. People are not thinking about attraction. So this is the condition when what they're doing is trying to identify if the face is the same person they saw in the previous trial or not. And in that condition, at the, what we find is in occipital cortex, there is the same kind of neural response that is no different than in the explicit condition where parts of this part of, parts of FFA and LOC, 
that there is increased neural activity for attractive faces even when people are not thinking about it. And we don't have a whole lot of, a lot of the cortical structures are not active in this case. And we would like to suggest that at least one, uh, 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 one implication of this is that this, parts, this part of our visual cortex is responding to beauty, to facial beauty. We don't know if it generalizes to other kinds of beauty, but it's responding to beauty all the time, whether or not you're thinking about it. So that's a kind of forward uh, inference, and forward inference by meaning we had a specific hypothesis that we were testing in specific defined parts of the brain. Now, there is also something called reverse inference that happens a lot in imaging, and I would, I'll give you an example in this study, which is that we also saw activity in the parts of the anterior insula, uh, which we also saw a little bit in the implicit condition. So this is not something that we were looking for, this is not something that we had a hypothesis, but nonetheless, we have this, this kind of neural activity. And so the question is, what might that mean? And whenever people ask that question of, with a pattern of neural activity, what might that mean? That the structure of that kind of question is a reverse inference. And what that means is what you're doing is saying, I am going to make an inference of a mental state based on a pattern of neural activity, okay? And it is probably better thought of, again, as hypothesis generating rather than hypothesis confirming. And so let's take the case of the insula. Uh, in this case, you could say, well, what's the insula doing? Right? And, and here are a variety of possibilities. Steve Brown at, uh, at uh, Yale had done a meta-analysis of uh, a variety of studies in which people made preference in beauty judgments. And in this meta-analysis, the anterior insula turned out to be the area that was most commonly activated across um, uh, many studies. And so maybe this is really another kind of beauty center. On the other hand, you could say, well, the anterior insula is known to have some control over our autonomic nervous system. And so that kind of sense you have when you see someone who's beautiful, maybe your pulse goes up a little bit, you get a little sweaty, you get to feel a little clammy. Maybe this is a part of the brain that's, that's instigating that. On the other hand, it could be that uh, recently there has been uh, a, a quite an interest in different resting networks in the brain, and there's one network that is referred to as the salience network, and it turns out the insula is a, uh, an important hub for the salience network, and it could be that it's not beauty per se, but beauty is one kind of salient stimulus, and so that's what we're seeing. And so the point of giving these examples is from the basis of that, it's a little less clear. Okay, so I am um, going to talk briefly about a study of architecture that we did, which was, um, this was looking at people's responses to interspaces spaces versus, uh, and what are the kinds of spaces they liked. And uh, I'll point out that this was done in conjunction with a number of people, including Lars Finch, who is here, who, uh, when you have these international collaborators, uh, sometimes you don't actually meet them because so much happens electronically, and so last night uh, was the first time I met him. Uh, and here, the, the, the question we were asking is, uh, is, is these parts of reward systems, particularly ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which is one of the most common areas that is responsive, to a variety of tasks, is this also responsive to architectural spaces? And what we found in this study behaviorally is that people, were, people liked curved spaces, as you can see in this auditorium, that these tend to be curved over rectilinear spaces, and that this preference for curved spaces uh, was associated with uh, neural activity within parts of ventromedial prefrontal cortex. Um, I will skip this study. And this is a study we did, and the point about this study is to talk about ways in which, as technology improves, uh, that our analytic methods also improve. And this is a, uh, a study where we asked the question of whether places and faces within reward systems have the same or different, uh, have the same or different neural signature. And in people who study decision-making, neuroeconomics, this sometimes is referred to as the common currency hypothesis. Is our pleasure across different kinds of domain the same or different? And the technical thing here, which I won't go into, is a kind of machine learning analysis that has only been around for the last few years, where you can take 
an area of neural activity and say, can you classify one object versus another? Can you classify a face response versus a place response, even if the overall neural activity is similar in, in both conditions? And basically what we found is that in medial uh, prefrontal cortex, ventromedial prefrontal cortex, again, one of the two areas that shows up in a lot of these kinds of studies, is that the classifier was unable to distinguish between landscapes and faces. And this seems to be consistent with this common currency hypothesis. However, in lateral orbifrontal cortex, there was a difference. And uh, as, uh, as has been mentioned before, the, uh, that you know, we seem to be, that faces have a special uh, place in our mental and uh, neural uh, world. Uh, and in lateral uh, orbifrontal cortex, we did see responses to faces in a way that there weren't responses to places. And so the general point being, here's a way in which new analytic techniques allowed us to ask a question that could not have been asked before, to ask the question of, in the brain, if there are responses, if there are pleasurable responses to two different domains, is it actually the same response or different? Okay. So I'm going to end with two points, uh, which is what I see as some of the challenges of if you want to have, really have a programmatic approach to neuroscience of architecture. And one is, and this has been mentioned before, is I think psychology is very, very important. That I think going straight to neuroscience without a mediation of a well-informed psychology, well-informed theory, I think is a, a strategy that is unlikely to work. And when it comes to, the, uh, to neuroaesthetics, there is a tradition. Uh, there is a tradition. I could uh, easily have put uh, Ernst Gombrich on this, uh, despite the fact that he was an art historian. Uh, as uh, Professor Kandel mentioned, uh, he was very well informed with respect to psychology. Uh, but you have Fechner at the beginning. Uh, and then along the way, you have these uh, luminaries. You have uh, Rudolf Arnheim, who was uh, profoundly influenced by the Gestalt psychologists. And then you have Daniel Berlein, who uh, in the 70s was very interested in the physiology of aesthetic experiences. And so you have this rich tradition, 150-year tradition of psychology, of aesthetics, that we can go back and draw upon in terms of thinking about our uh, our. Uh, our experiments in neuroscience. And the final point I'd like to say is that there is another kind of issue, I think, in architecture, which is buildings are not buildings are not buildings. And what do I mean by that? Uh, which is that if you have a research program, the question is, what is it, what is the question with respect to architecture? And I'll give you a few examples here which are not meant to be exhaustive. They're not mutually exclusive. But if your question is building as object, that, that itself raises a set of questions that guides the kind of research you might do. If you say building as landscape, that evokes a different kind of question. If you say building as historic document, as cultural artifact, that raises a different kind of question. If you say building as tool, as function, that's a different kind of question. If you say building a space to create a certain kind of sensibility, whether that's awe or, or mourning or sacredness, spirituality, that's a different kind of question. If you say building as a space through which people have to move, that's a different kind of question. Uh, and I think depending on how you frame the specific question, that determines the kind of research program you might have. So I'll leave you with these final things, which as, as consumers, of neuroscience and neuroscience of architecture, as opposed to neuroscience and architecture, it's worth being clear about whether the data you're seeing is descriptive or experimental in this kind of narrow sense I'm talking about, whether the data is derived from a forward or reverse in inference. I would suggest that there is mileage to be gained uh, of thinking of the experience of architecture as a focus of inquiry, uh, that the psychology of architecture needs to be uh, needs to be developed in concert with the neuroscience of architecture. And then you have this issue of the general framing, which I suggested that the aesthetic triad might be one general kind of uh, frame. But then superimposed on that is this more specific framing of the particular notion of building or architecture that is part of your research program. Thank you.